So, hello, let's talk about um, statistics of donors and acceptor levels. We'll do this in the context that uh, instead of having electrons moving throughout the whole crystal and being uh, delocalized and obeying a certain statistic, we now have to deal with the occupancy or, 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 on, of electrons in these donors. And we've uh, considered these donors like uh, a hydrogen atom that is sitting inside a uh, continuum material that has a certain dielectric constant and that has a certain effective mass. That worked very well. Um, there's experimental validation for that approach, but it also means we need to deal with the occupancy of uh, such uh, donors and acceptors in a slightly different way than in the continuum state way. So in the continuum, we had uh, discussed this in the past, you have the distributed states, you have bands, uh, electrons have their own quantum numbers, they have to occupy different states, and there's a, a plethora of these states available, almost a continuum of states that needs to be filled up. Uh, if the number of uh, Lx of states uh, or uh, number of atoms in the system, Lx over n, is, is, is extremely large, then the case spacing uh, will be very narrow, uh, very thin, uh, thinly distributed. So you can pack a lot of states into this volume and you still will separate the electrons spatially in these different states. So the point is we were able to derive the Fermi, uh, Fermi distributions with those kind of arguments. Now if you're making a system smaller and start to bind electrons uh, to uh, smaller uh, uh, system states, uh, that means these electrons really have to be spatially clearly separated and the energy levels might be uh, clearly separated. As you subdivide the system, you don't um, uh, lose any number of states, but the configuration of states is going to be different. And um, that needs to be considered in the statistics of occupancies of these states. So um, let's dive into that a little bit and uh, I'll, I'll go and show you, looking ahead, what is the f uh, formula that we want to derive and, mo and then we'll motivate the work uh, from there. So in a uh, bulk material where the, the, the charge must be uh, netting out to zero. So the sum over the whole charges minus the sum over the electron charges and the sum of the donors that are ionized and the sum of the uh, acceptors that are ionized must be integrated out to zero. So that's overall the overall total volume. If the material is spatially homogeneous, the integrand must be zero. So we can have a distribution of holes, electrons, uh, ionized donors, ionized acceptors. That needs to sum out to zero. We have already expressions that we calculated for hole densities and electron densities, and that was done for the Fermi distributions of electrons that are distributed in space. And uh, now we're going to have to do something similar for uh, uh, donors that are ionized, and we find uh, almost Fermi Dirac-like distributions of those states, but there is coefficients in there that make it look slightly different than these uh, the standard distributions we have seen before. So this is where we're going, and in the next slides you'll see where these uh, slightly different coefficients come from. All right, so let's look at this hydrogen atom in its host material with a different dielectric constant and a different effective mass. We have seen that there's states in there. Uh, there's excited states, not just one uh, particular state, and there could be deep uh, level uh, traps as well. But uh, we'll, we'll just start looking at a, a simplified system like this. So let's imagine we're looking at silicon and we look at um, four atoms and let's, if they were far apart with a barrier that is really huge, we would get maybe two states per atom. Now we know that if these uh, atoms are sitting closer, we're starting to uh, build bands. We will understand, we've derived these band structure and the interaction between these uh, different uh, atoms uh, form these bands and you will have two states, uh, two end states per band uh, and that includes for the spin. Now if we 
introduce a foreigner, so to speak, into the system. Uh, we have this donor atom, say. Uh, we assume that the surrounding silicon atoms still talk to each other strongly and they form a band, but these bands are now missing some states. We actually take out two states out of it. So we're modifying the distribution uh, of available states in the system and we'll start to consider this donor to be a special introduced uh, item in, in our system. All right. So now let's look at the distribution and the occupancy of um, these donor states. Let's consider a single donor state that has just one level. Um, in that system, in principle, we could have four states. There could be, uh, this, this donor uh, level could be empty. It could have one upspin, it could have one downspin, and it could have two electrons uh, sitting on it in principle with one up and one down spin. All right, so we'll tabulate these states and uh, want to calculate the probability of these occupancies, similar as we've done before, and now we do this uh, just as we've done before with a partition function as we calculated uh, the Fermi function before. So we write down the partition function here is the sum over all probabilities of uh, the system configurations, and we pick out any particular uh, probability of uh, any configuration. And that is characterized by the energy of the particle and the number of electrons uh, measured against the, the reference, the Fermi energy. So let's do this for the state where there is no electrons in this uh, donor atom. So there's no up and down spin, it has no energy and no, uh, no electrons in there then this exponential up there sums out to be 1. Now let's consider the case where there's either an up or a down spin, and let's imagine that the energy level that they could be at is identical, we call it EI. So the probability of finding an electron with energy EI and the occupancy of NI in the system is e to EI minus EF over KT, Boltzmann distributed, over the partition function. Now, if we look at um, the con uh, consider the case where there's two electrons in there, up and down spin uh, electron, um, that is uh, forbidden through Coulomb interactions. You would have to do something really special in your device to enable two electrons to be sitting on a single donor. That can be done. And I'm referring you to the single atom transistor paper where you can measure such things, but those were not bulk devices. So in bulk, you cannot put two electrons onto a single donor. That's just uh, forbidden by Coulomb interaction. And so that's not part of the partition function. That is, an, we don't, we just forbid this case, so to speak. So we're stuck or left over with three different uh, states that make up the partition function, and we can write down the probabilities of these states. All right. So what's the probability that a donor is empty, i.e. it's a charged donor? Um, the probability is the uh, occupation, uh, the probability of finding the zero, zero state sum uh, divided by the probability of all the, uh, the states. Okay, so you plug in these expressions here, including the, uh, with the partition uh, function z, and you find that the probability of finding a donor that is empty is similar looking to the Fermi distribution, but it has this factor of two in it, okay? Now, what's the probability of a, do a donor containing uh, one electron, uh, at least one electron, that is one minus F0, and you'll find that there's a uh, coefficient one half here in this distribution function, okay? So you just carry through a partition function calculation of a probability of a certain state. All right, so let's do the similar thing for acceptor, acceptor atoms. There the case is slightly more complicated. So here we have boron and silicon. Uh, let's assume that there is one hole present and we have n minus one charges in the system, or the hole is filled and we have n capital N charges. All right, these 
uh, acceptor level sit closer to the valence band edge. And as we discussed in the previous sections, there is a light hole and a heavy hole, and each atom contributes two states up and down spin to the band. So there we have two n states. And every time a host atom is replaced by an impurity atom, two states disappear, as we had just discussed, not just one uh, for, for the electrons. So an acceptor atom close to the heavy and light hole bands removes four states from these bands. And now we need to configure these four states and populate them with a single electron. So what's available is really the uh, triple zero state and then four configurations where we include a single uh, hole in the configuration. And we'll have to do the same calculation of probabilities of occupation, again with a partition function, and we can carry that through. So there's five configurations, um, no hole at all, and holes on, uh, and the light hole and the heavy hole configurations. Okay? So uh, the 0, 0, 0 configuration means that there's a charged state that has n electrons, n minus one protons. So let's, if you have a single hole on there, then that means that we have n minus one electrons and n minus one protons. So that's true for any of these four configurations as laid out here. All right. So going from the uh, triple zero to any of the zero zero one states, um, the number of electrons goes down by one. The energy of these states goes down by minus Ea because the uh, acceptor energy is uh, released occupying a state. So now we can do the same thing as what we have done before with a partition function. We consider these five states to make up the partition and we need to account for the energy of and the occupancy of these states. So again, we, if we consider the zero, zero, zero state, we have uh, no energy associated with that, and we measure the, no, uh, it, it against the reference EF, and we can calculate these other energies for single occupancy of an acceptor atom. So we have an association of minus EA with a state and a minus one electron taken out from the EF. So we end up with Ea minus Ef in the distribution function uh, as a probability for that particular state. Okay, that's really uh, following the step sh steps three and four on the previous slide. And then we can calculate P00 as, um, oh, sorry, the occupancy of uh, F0000 as the probability of that state divided by all the available uh, probabilities like this in the distribution function, and we'll get an expression that looks like this, that has this factor of 4 in it. All right, so now let's calculate this uh, similar to what we had in the uh, electron case. We're interested in uh, empty donor states. We have done this for electrons and had an expression like this, where we have the uh, occupancy uh, of um, uh, ionized donors. And we can do the same thing for um, ionized acceptors. And we have these coefficients 2 and 4 that have to do with the uh, number of bands, uh, number of states that uh, are added uh, or subtracted uh, from the system. All right. So what, this, uh, what one does typically is actually one assumes a band degeneracy. And this is this coefficient GD that is uh, here in the system, um, like this. So that can be uh, generalized, where you have this coefficient GD in it, and you can uh, uh, not uh, denote this as some e to the epsilon kBT. Okay, it just, you convert, you say GD, I'm going to represent as e to the epsilon over kT. You just define it like this. And if you do that, you can effectively say, well, I'm going to modify my donor level and give it a slightly different uh, energy level. So that's uh, numerically the same. It's a matter of mapping if you're talking about donors and acceptors. So you can do this 
and convert the donor levels into an effective donor level so you don't have to worry about this degeneracy factor explicitly. Okay? So it's just a handy thing to do. All right. So in the uh, previous sections, we have calculated P uh, with the Fermi functions, explicitly Fermi one-half functions. And we have done the same uh, with the electrons. This should be an NC here. And we have now the occupancies of the uh, donors and the acceptors explicitly as well. Now, if we're dealing with non-degenerate systems, um, we have seen that we can convert this Fourier Dirac integral into just delta functions with coefficients like these here. And uh, we can uh, just do, use Boltzmann distributions. And we didn't convert or change any of these expressions here. We just used uh, KT explicitly instead of beta. All right, so given this expression below, you can now calculate uh, NP and ND plus and NA minus explicitly, okay? All right, so let's calculate an intrinsic concentration with this, uh, with this approach. So intrinsic means we don't have donors, so we cancel those expressions, and we had seen, done this in the uh, previous lecture already. Uh, the difference between n and p must be zero, so these coefficients, uh, these uh, expressions must equal to each other, and we had seen already the Fermi level is the intrinsic energy level that is roughly at uh, mid-gap, e.g. over 2. But um, if the two densities of uh, states at the covalence and conduction band are different, so they're not, this, uh, not identical, then you have an up or down correction to the uh, intrinsic Fermi level. That correction in general is very small. Ballpark, you can estimate that the Fermi level, uh, intrinsic Fermi level is roughly mid-gap. All right, so here is this expression for the statistics of donors and acceptors, and it's derived again by partition functions of occupancies of states. All right, so that concludes the uh, discussion of uh, statistics of these donors and acceptors, and next we'll look at the temperature dependence of these carrier concentrations. That's going to be in the next section.